increases positive emotion. That is uh, usually I call the uh, inner disarmament. You see, inner spiritual development is the basis of genuine lasting world peace. In order to get rid of the weapons or not need the weapons, you first need to take away the the feeling that they need to be there. You need to gain an understanding that they're not going to actually bring any happiness or any anything positive in the end. <laughs>
ท่านผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านคะ่ะโปรแกรมนี้ประมาณ3ชั่วโมงนะคะ um, Ladies and gentlemen, this program takes about three hours, and then there will be our two keynote speakers. ซีดีและหนังสือหวังว่าทุกท่านที่เข้าร่วมงานคงได้รับเรียบร้อยแล้วนะคะเราจะมีหลังเลิกงานนะคะ Ladies and gentlemen, s i a m University will provide you CD and the book named I Love Thailand, the end of the presentation. Thank you. Now we're waiting for the official opening ceremony.
หน้าที่เป็นพิธีกรขอต้อนรับสู่การประชุมวิชาการเฉลิมพระเกียรติเนื่องในวโลกาสมหามงคลเฉลิมพระชนมพรรษา80พรรษาโดยเน้นพระราชปัตยาเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงในการพัฒนาประเทศโดยพนักท่านโคสิตปั้นเตี่ยมรัฐรองนายกรัฐมนตรีและรัฐมนตรีว่าการกระทรวงอุตสาหกรรมและศาสตราจารย์โรเบิร์ตอเล็กซานเดอร์มันเดลนักเศรษฐศาสตร์ผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลในปีพุทธศักราช2542 Excellencies Professor Dr. p o n c h a i m o n k o n w a n i t the President of Siam University and distinguished guests Welcome to the celebration of His Majesty the King's the 80th birthday international conference on sufficiency economy philosophy and sustainable development by our honorable keynote speakers. His Excellency Kosit Bankinra, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Industry of Thailand. Professor Dr. Robert Alexander Mandel, 1999 Nobel Laureate in Economic Science. และต่อจากนี้ท่านผู้มีเกียรติครับผมขอเรียนเชิญดรพรชัยมงคลวณิชอธิการบดีมหาวิทยาลัยสยามกล่าวต้อนรับท่านผู้มีเกียรติและกล่าวเปิดงานครับ Ladies and gentlemen may I now call upon Professor Dr พรชัยมงคลวณิช the president of Siam University to kindly deliver the opening speech and declare the conference open. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. p o n c h a i m a n k o n w a n i the President of Siam University. His Excellency, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Siam University, and the International Association of University Presidents as one of the co-hosts of the British Dialogue Towards a Culture of Peace. I would like to welcome all of you to this special lecture to mark the 80th birthday anniversary of His Majesty the King Pumipon Adunyadeh of Thailand. We are also proud that the International Peace Foundation has also chosen Siam University as the venue to start this second round of its dialogues in Asia with a special lecture of Professor Alex, uh, Robert Alexander Mandel, 1999 Nobel Laureate in Economics. And I would like to say that he is also the father of the theory of optimum currency areas, as well as the financial architect who designed the first plan of the common currency in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, since Thailand is also the birthplace of sufficiency economy philosophy, led by our beloved His Majesty King Pumipon Adunyadeh. Siam University also proudly invite His Excellency Kosit Pampian Rat, Deputy Prime Minister and Ministry of Industry of Thailand, 
to give a lecture on behalf of Prime Minister Surayut Juranon on the topic of sufficiency economy and national security and stability development of Thailand. I also would like to quote a speech by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan about His Majesty the King Pumipon Adunyadeh and sufficiency economy philosophy as the following. As visionary thinker, His Majesty has played an invaluable role in shaping the global development dialogue. His Majesty's sufficiency economy philosophy emphasizing on moderation, responsible consumption, and listening to external shock is of great relevance worldwide. During this time of rapid globalization, therefore, we at Siam University hope that all distinguished participants, including a lot of students who are presented here, which will be the generations to come, would you benefit from this special event of which we expect to provide options and alternative way to strengthen up Thai and also regional economy stemming from internal strength in this era of opening up and globalization. Thank you very much. ขอขอบคุณท่านอาจารย์บดีมหาวิทยาลัยสยามเป็นอย่างยิ่งครับและต่อจากนี้ขอเรียนเชิญคุณอูเว่โมลาเวสประธาน International Peace Foundation กล่าวต้อนรับท่านผู้มีเกียรติ Thank you very much, Professor Dr. p o n c h a i m a n g k o n w a n e the person of Siam University. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now request Mr. Uwe m o r a w e s the Chairman of International Peace Foundation, to kindly deliver a welcome remark. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Uwe m o r a w e s And welcome to the first ASEAN wide event series, Bridges Dialogues Towards the Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non political and non religious foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities. Starting now this November, Bridges will be continuously held in Thailand and the Philippines until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The first ASEAN-wide series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the Bridges series, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand between November 2003 and April 2005. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders, another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by finding ways of working together. After the success of Bridges in Thailand, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international understanding by expanding its program beyond Thailand to stimulate the intellectual, scientific, and cultural exchange in the region. 
The first ASEAN-wide series of bridges will therefore continuously take place in Thailand and the Philippines from November 2007 to April 2008, comprising events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates will visit the region not all at once, but separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of six months. The topics of the ongoing events will deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world, and with a wide range of issues in the fields of politics, economy, science, culture, and the media. They will especially highlight the challenges of both globalization and regionalism and its impact on development and international cooperation. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges through Nobel laureates with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation. ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuing process of synergies to make the series of events a sustainable success for Thailand, for the Philippines, and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to the Thai Chairman of Bridges, Prime Minister General Surayu Chulanond, and to our Honorary Chairman, former Prime Minister Anand Panyarachun. Their powerful guidance paved the way for bridges to bear fruit. I'm also grateful to President Poan Shai Mongkonwanit and to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make the idea of bridges a reality. I would like to thank you, say thank you to everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help, may it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 1999 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Robert Alexander Mundell, who has agreed to come to Thailand without any honorarium to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much. ต้องขอขอบคุณคุณอุเวโมลาเวสเป็นอย่างยิ่งนะครับและในโอกาสต่อไปนี้ท่านผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านจะได้รับชมวิดิทัศน์ในหัวข้อนานาทัศน์ปัจญาเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงโดยสี่เอกทักษะในทางเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงนําโดยคณะท่านองคมนตรีศาสตราจารย์เกียรติคุณนายแพทย์เกษมวัฒนชัยดรสุเมธตันติเวชกุลเลขาธิการมูลนิธิชัยพัฒนาอาจารย์วิจิตสุพินิษคณะบดีบัณฑิตวิทยาลัยสาขาบริหารธุรกิจและท่านสุดท้ายคุณสันติวิลาศักดานนท์ประธานสภาอุตสาหกรรมเป็นเวลายาวประมาณ15นาทีและมีความยินดีที่จะมอบให้ในรูปแบบซีดีฉบับยาวและหนังสือฉันรักประเทศไทย Thank you very much Mr. Uwey Marawais, the Chairman of International Peace Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, from now on, we'll start the program with a video presentation. It displays the different points of view about sufficiency economy philosophy of His Majesty the King Pumipot under the date of Thailand. By His Excellency Kasem Matanachai, Private Counselor, Dr. Sumit Anti Veshakun, the Secretary General of Thai Patana Foundation. Professor Vitit Subminit Dean of the Graduate School, Siam University. And Mr. Santi Vilasak Danon. 
the chairman of the Federation of the Industry. The presentation takes about 15 minutes. And for this special occasion, ladies and gentlemen, Siam University are pleased to give the CD and the book name, I Love Thailand, to all of you, to our distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, our video presentation. Thank you.
ต้องเอาเป้าหมายพอมีพอกินพออยู่ก่อนพอมีพอกินพออยู่แล้วขยับขึ้นไปเป็นอยู่ดีกินดีแล้วก็มันขยับไปเรื่อยๆแต่ถ้าเป็นตัวแต่ปัจจัยที่ไปใช้ในการมีเวลาเวลาเราเกินพอดีพอกินนะเรากินดีอยู่ดีนะท่านให้นึกถึงความพอประมาณนี่ก็คือว่าให้เหมาะสมกับอัตราของตัวเองในการเรียนพระกิจนั้นเนี่ยก็จะนึกถึงความรอบคอบความพอดีความพอเพียงและความมีคุณธรรมจริยธรรมอันนี้แง่ของความพอเพียงความพอดีนั้นเนี่ยก็คือว่าในแง่ตัวเองจะต้องเมินธุรกิจในกรอบของความมีความระมัดระวังไม่ลงทุนในสิ่งที่ไม่คุ้นเคยไม่ลงทุนเกินกำลังความสามารถของของตัวเองจะทําให้พอดีพอดีเลยทำตามนี้ว่าสิทธิพอเพียงเราต้องมองหลายประเด็นด้วยในอุตสาหกรรมนอกจากประเด็นที่ผมกล่าวแล้วเราต้องมองว่าคนของเราเป็นยังไงบ้างคือผมเรียกคนนี้ก็เป็นหัวใจในการพัฒนาในการอุตสาหกรรมด้วยนะถ้าคนทุกคนรู้จักความพอดีถ้าเราให้ความรู้พนักงานของเราเราให้การฝึกอบรมข้ออยู่ประจำนะครับว่าเออคุณมีเงินเดือนขนาดนี้นะคุณใช้จ่ายแบบนี้คุณการออมหรือถ้าเรามีการแนะนําเรื่อยผมเชื่อคนงานเขาก็จะจำพวกนี้ไว้นะถ้าคนงานมีส่วนร่วมในการด้วยเขาก็ยิ่งใหญ่จะทำงานให้ให้กับอุตสาหกรรมเลยทำงานให้กับธุรกิจของเราได้มากมากไม่ว่าคุณจะดําเนินการธุรกิจอะไรก็แล้วแต่เมื่อรู้จักคุณรู้จักตัวเองรู้ภาระกำลังแล้วคุณก็สามารถเลือกทางเดินที่ใช้ปัญญาเพื่อนำการได้เพราะฉะนั้นเมื่อเป็นอย่างนี้แล้วเนี่ยนะครับชีวิตก็คุณจะมั่นคงไอ้ความสามารถของตัวเองในการลงทุนนั้นเนี่ยมันก็มีเครื่องชี้ในแง่วิชาการการเงินก็นั่นชัดเจนแล้วใช้ปฏิบัติโดยทั่วไปว่าการลงทุนนั้นเนี่ยเกินกรอบความสามารถในการประคืนจากกระแสไรายได้ในอนาคตหรือไม่ถ้าเราไม่บัดตามแนวทางวิชาการประการนี้ซึ่งเป็นที่ยอมรับและใช้ทั่วไปเนี่ยก็มีโอกาสที่เราจะมีปัญหาความไม่สามารถในการชำระคืนหนี้สินในอนาคตได้เพราะโลกนี้โลกรอบตัวเรามันมีการเปลี่ยนแปลงอย่างรวดเร็วเหลือเกินเพราะนั้นพระองค์ท่านได้กำหนดว่าจะต้องรอบรู้รอบคอบระมัดระวังด้วยต้องทันโลกนะครับต้องทันเหตุการณ์ต้องเรียนรู้สิ่งที่เปลี่ยนแปลงอยู่รอบตัวอยู่ตลอดเวลาเพื่อจะสามารถปรับตัวเองให้ทันเหตุการณ์แล้วก็จะได้ประเจนกับสิ่งที่เปลี่ยนแปลงรอบตัวเองได้ผู้ติดมือร้องจำไว้ว่าผู้ติดบางครั้งนี่ถ้าเราเราไม่พอดีมันจะค่อยๆโผล่ขึ้นเรื่อยๆใช่ไหมไม่ไม่ใช่ว่างานทีเดียวโตเพี้ยงมันก็ลากมันก็เลยไม่แข็งแรงเหมือนต้นไม้นะถ้ามันค่อยๆโตขึ้นลากมันก็จะแข็งแรงนะผมคิดว่าพวกนี้ถ้าเราค่อยๆทำค่อยๆคิดถ้าเราดูอุตสาหกรรมในพื้นทางเราอุตสาหกรรมใหญ่ๆแล้วอุตสาหกรรมมาจากธุรกิจก็จะมีเล็กๆมาก่อนเขาก็ค่อยทำขึ้นมาก็ค่อยให้เกิดโตขึ้นเกิดโตขึ้นในแง่ของการปฏิบัติของนักธุรกิจเป็นรายบุคคลว่าถ้าเราดําเนินการไปโดยใช้ความพอดีพอเพียงแล้วก็มีคุณธรรมนั้นเนี่ยเราคงไม่เอารับเอาเปรียบลูกค้ารักษาคุณภาพของสินค้าใช้ราคาที่พอสมควรไม่เอากําไรสูงสุดอย่างรีบด่วนหลังจะเกิดวิกฤตจะแน่ใจสิณวันนี้เราก็จะมาถามดูว่าทําไมวิกฤตเศรษฐกิจจึงเกิดขึ้นเศรษฐกิจนั้นเกิดขึ้นมาจากการลงทุนที่เกินตัวการลงทุนที่ไม่มีเหตุมีผลลงทุนด้วยความโลภนะครับเพราะขณะนี้ต้องยอมรับว่าโลกของเรานั้นถูกนําด้วยลักษณะบริโภคนิยมทุกคนไขว้าที่จะแสวงหากําไรสูงสุดโดยไม่คํานึงถึงเลยว่าในการประกอบกิจกรรมของตัวเองนั้นจะส่งผลกระทบต่อโลกอย่างไรถ้าเราสามารถรักษาแนวทางนี้ไว้ได้เนี่ยนะครับมันจะสามารถสร้างความเชื่อถือความปักดีของลูกค้าของเราได้ในระยะยาวเป็นประโยชน์ในทางเศรษฐกิจก็จะมีต่อเนื่องไปในอนาคตอีกยาวนานสรุปก็คือความพอเพียงมีความพอประมาณตามอัตภาพอัตภาพสำคัญมาก
สามีเหตุผลแล้วก็ภูมิคุ้มกันจะตัดสินใจในเชิงนโยบายตัดสินใจเชิงปฏิบัติตัดสินใจในชีวิตส่วนตัวก็นึกถึงองค์ประกอบทั้งสามเนี่ยนึกถึงองค์ประกอบทั้งสามจริงๆเดี๋ยวจะเป็นว่าทำให้ตามฐานะของตัวเองสภาพของตัวเองคุณมีเงินเยอะคุณก็ซื้อของซื้อรถอะไรได้แต่ว่าคุณมีรายได้น้อยคุณก็มาวางแผนว่าเออคุณจะออมทรัพย์เท่าไหร่เพื่อใช้ในอาอาณาจักรใช่ไหมคุณจะออมมาให้ลูกหลานคุณการศึกษาของลูกหลานหรือเปล่าแล้วคุณจะไม่ใช้ตัวเองเมื่อไหร่แล้วใช้จ่ายด้วยเท่าไหร่พวกนี้มันมันใช้ได้หมดก็เราเอามาเอามาปรับปรุงเข้าแล้วก็เอามาเข้าให้กับสถานการณ์ของแต่ละบริษัทหรือแต่ละบุคคลวงจรของการนําเอาคําสอนเนี่ยเอามาใช้เนี่ยมันมีสามสามสถานีรถไฟอันแรกเขาเรียกว่าปริยัติปริยัติคือทฤษฎีทําความเข้าใจก็มันใช่ก่อนว่าปัญญานี่คืออะไรอันนั้นคือปริยัติเสร็จแล้วปฏิบัติสถานีที่สองคือปฏิบัติปริยัติปฏิบัติปฏิบัติก็คือไปออกแบบเช่นเราจะเอาไปใช้พัฒนาในระดับโรงเรียนในการเรียนการสอนการเราไปออกแบบแบบแรกระบบไปใช้ในระบบแบบระบบเขาเรียกปฏิบัติแล้วทำดูใช้ TDCA ทําดูกระบวนการ TDCA แผนดูเช็คแอคอยู่เรื่อยๆเสร็จแล้วปฏิเวทปฏิเวทก็คือประเมินผลที่ว่าทําแล้วมันดีขึ้นไหมก็สรุปในขณะนี้ก็เป็นที่ยอมรับของผู้วิชาการทั่วโลกแล้วว่าทรัพยากรธรรมชาติดีน้ำลงไปไม่พอแล้วครับสำหรับมนุษย์ทั่วโลกมันมีแค่นี้ร้อยหลอทรัพยากรร้อยหลอไม่ทุกทีจำนวนมนุษย์เพิ่มขึ้นเพิ่มขึ้นนะครับต่อไปนี้มนุษย์รู้สึกว่าจะต้องตามสงครามแย่งทรัพยากรกันแล้วขณะนี้สงครามพลังงานคงเป็นจุดที่แล้วเราก็ทายว่าสิบสี่ก็น่านั้นรัฐบาลหน้าสี่สงครามเนี่ยน้ำแล้วมนุษย์จะแย่งอะไรอีกก็ไม่รู้เพราะฉะนั้นถ้าหากเราบริโภคในลักษณะที่มีขอบจุดที่มีเหตุผลเกินตัวเกินภาวะปริมาณที่โลกจะรับได้ผลสุดท้ายความหมายนะจะนำมาสู่มนุษย์ชาติอย่างแน่นอนที่สุดขณะนี้ชาตินะครับมนุษย์กำลังบริโภคโลกในแร่ตาสามตอนนี้สมมติว่าบริโภคไปสามโลกทุกเฉยต่อมาได้เป็นหนึ่งเท่านั้นบริโภคโลกไปเกินทุนอีกสองจะหากนํามาใช้ในเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงตามที่ประกาศไปเรื่องหัวรักษาแล้วผมคิดว่าภาพของการบริโภคหนึ่งต่อหนึ่งคือทํายังไงเมื่อบริโภคไปหนึ่งแล้วเราสามารถฟื้นฟูกับหนึ่งทรัพยากรมาชดเชยได้อีกหนึ่งในเท่ากันจะทําให้นําไปสู่คําที่เรามักจะนิยมใช้แต่ไม่ค่อยปฏิบัติก็คือการพัฒนาที่ยั่งยืนถ้าเป็นในเรื่องของโลกนี้เราพูดกันมากแต่เราทําเป็นแค่ไหนเท่าไรผมคิดว่าทุกชาติเราไปเป็นที่เชื่อที่เชื่อได้จากเมื่อเราปฏิบัติตามคำที่เราคงไม่ยืนไปทรงนำเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงล้อเลี้ยงชีวาเป็นปรัชญาเลิกฟ้าต้องตัดกระีไทยทั้งพ้องภูมิใจไทยเป็นไทยจนวันนี้พระองค์ภูมิพลที่ภูมิครองไทยไทยทั้งพ้องภูมิใจไทยเป็นไทยจนวันนี้ขอขอบคุณท่านผู้ทรงพระวุฒิทุกท่านที่ให้การบรรยายเกี่ยวกับเรื่องเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงซึ่งจะเห็นได้ว่าเศรษฐกิจพอเพียงคือแนวทางใหม่ในการพัฒนาที่สามารถนำไปประยุกต์ใช้กับปัญหาในสกาลเปลี่ยนแปลงในโลกปัจจุบันและสถานการณ์ต่างๆได้ในขอบเขตที่กว้างขวาง Ladies and gentlemen from the video presentation it can be concluded that we can adjust ourselves With the, go the global changes, by applying the sufficiency economy philosophy. ต่อจากนี้ขอเรียนเชิญศาสตราจารย์โรบินเจเลวิส
คณะบดีคณะความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างประเทศมหาวิทยาลัยโคลัมเบียกล่าวแนะนำศาสตราจารย์โรเบิร์ตอเล็กซานเดอร์มันเดลเพื่อกล่าวคำบรรยาย Ladies and gentlemen, before the presentation starts, may I invite Dean Lewis, Dean of School of International Relations and Public Affairs of Columbia University, to take the floor. Dean Lewis served for the last 20 years as Associate Dean of CEPA and also as Executive Director of the Global Public Policy Network. He will kindly give a brief introduction of sufficiency economy and also introduce our first honorable keynote speaker, Professor Robert Alexander Mandel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Lewis. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be back here at Siam University, um, and I bring thanks and greetings to my good friend, President Ponchai. Um, I will not presume to give an introduction to sufficiency economy because you have just heard a very good introduction to it, but I will presume to introduce to you my colleague, uh, Robert Mundell from Columbia University. Um, where uh, I, as the speaker mentioned, have been uh, teaching and been a dean for 22 years until earlier this year. Um, professor Mundell is university professor at Columbia University, where he has taught since 1974. After doing his undergraduate studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada, as uh, in economics and Slavonic studies, he studied at the University of Washington the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the London School of Economics, receiving his PhD in industrial economics from MIT in 1956. He was then a postdoctoral fellow in political economy at University of Chicago, and he taught in Canada at UBC, at Stanford University, and in Italy at the Johns Hopkins Bologna Center for Advanced International Studies, before joining the International Monetary Fund in 1961. From 1966 to 1971, he was professor of economics at the University of Chicago and editor of the Journal of Political Economy. Professor Mundell has been an advisor to a number of international agencies and organizations, including the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Commission, the US Federal Reserve Board, the US Treasury, as well as numerous governments, institutions, and companies around the world. Bob Mundell's writings include numerous articles in scientific journals and, of course, many books that he has authored. He prepared the first plans for a common currency in Europe and is known as the father of the theory of optimum currency areas, and I might add, he is known more popularly to all of us as the father of the euro. He developed the international macroeconomic model, the Mundell Fleming model, the monetary fiscal policy mix framework for economic stability, fixed and flexible exchange rates, the theory of growth and inflation, also known as the Mundell Toyota effect, which relates, relating, which relates monetary expansion, the real rate of interest and economic growth and was a pioneer in the development of supply-side economics. And as I mentioned earlier, played a key role, early role, in the founding of the Euro. Six volumes of his collected works were published in Chinese in 2004. Professor Mundell is an honorary president of the Mundell International University located in Beijing, China, and is the recipient of several honorary degrees in different countries, as well as more than 40 uh, honorary professorships around China. He is the chairman of the Santa Colomba Group in Siena, Italy, on world currency. In 1999, Professor Mundell received the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of monetary and fiscal policy under different exchange rate regimes 
and his analysis of optimum currency areas. In 2001, he was appointed Companion of the Order of Canada. In 2005, he received the Global Economics Award of the Kiel Institute in Germany and was also appointed Grand Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Order of Merit, Duke of Parma. He lives today between New York City and Tuscany, Italy, but those of us who know him well realize we are much more likely to meet him in Bangkok, in Beijing, in Tokyo, in Dubai, and many other capitals around the world. He is truly a global citizen, and we are all very lucky to have him here with us today to share his ideas with us. Great pleasure to introduce Professor Robert A. Mundell. Officials, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to see uh, such a welcoming audience. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk on the subject, fitting globalization into the National Economic Development Strategy. Uh, I guess that's uh, coming up. Uh, the, uh, I'll just talk on these uh, megatrends, globalization, economic model and uh, the sufficiency economy, a little bit redundant after the introduction we heard, uh, sufficiency policies and the harmony in international uh, arrangements and then currency and world money. Uh, world economy today uh, is in a remarkable period. Uh, th this year is, I think, unprecedented in that uh, for the first time, all the major economies in the world are giving them four codes for the rapidly expanding. This is a great period. It's never happened before. And uh, of course, it's, it's uh, marked by some incidents and some pessimism and other things in the last quarter. And we, it doesn't mean that it's because the past has been good, the future is going to be as good. But uh, it's uh, nevertheless something to note that never before has the world economy been in such uh, a great position? And I say here, uh, what are the drivers? What's the reason for this? Well, this is a picture of the world economy as I see it. These globes, uh, spheres, represent the big and little powers of the world. The, the uh, area of those circles represents more or less GDP of countries. Monetary power, if you like, or GDP. And uh, the GDP of the United States, the center area, here is uh, $14 trillion. The GDP of the euro area is uh, about $12 trillion at the current exchange rate. And the yen area is about uh, 4 and a half to $5 trillion. And the uh, RMB area is the is taken over the position here of number four in the world at... Uh, at um, uh, $3 trillion, uh, a big step. Then in terms of currency areas, you should also count the uh, pound sterling, which is independent of the uh, of the euro area. But we'll uh, have play with those a little later. Um, um, the key trends that we need to keep in mind Uh, uh, 
this is uh, something that's going to be with us for a long time. The penetration of that revolution in all the economies of the world is going to be great. It's also, um, as you might say, it's a democratic in a sense experience. Democratic because it, um, it lowers the cost of an expensive factor of production model in technology. And it, creates the access for those who get access who reach the stage to access it, they can access global knowledge of a kind of level in, with a speed never, never before. And the third factor is the advent of the euro. Uh, this is a, it's important because it uh, changed the power configuration of the international monetary system. I, uh, people have often asked me how, how important is the euro, and I would say it's the uh, second most important monetary event of the 20th century. It just made it in the 20th century. The first, it, the fourth, because as I say, it changes the power configuration of the system. Uh, the first important event, the most important event, was, in my opinion, the creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. That's more important than the breakdown of the gold standard, the creation of the Brentwood system, the moves up and down the Brentwood exchanges, because um, those two events, the dollar and now perhaps the euro, have the power to alter it. After 1915, <laughs> by, by the time of World War I, the U.S. economy is, had been 100 years before um, had been an uh, economy of four million people, and suddenly it was over a hundred million people, the most productive economy in the world, and by the time World War I, it was bigger than the next three biggest economies put together, Britain, Germany, and France put together. So when the Federal Reserve was created, it created a central bank for the biggest economy by far in the world, and the future super economy, and that creation of that central bank and that currency gave the United States the power to change, alter the uh, uh, condition of the international monetary system for the 20th century. The condition to, to maintain, develop, or break down or eliminate the gold standard. And in fact, what turned out a long run, it turned the gold standard became a dollar standard, and they were still in that now. But then the creation of the euro in 1999 raises up something else that makes our system look a little more like a bipolar system. The four, four challenges. Well, I, I did mention the rise of China. I should mention that, but I spend so much time in China, I sometimes forget to mention it. But this is the a very big event. Uh, People have become accustomed to talking about the, um, of course, the, the uh, U.S. economy and the European economy and the Japanese economy, and then they talk about the BRIC economies, the B-R-I-C economies, an uh, acronym for um, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But I think that's now obsolete because, in fact, China is in a different category than the other economies. China is an economy now of three uh, trillion dollar economy. And the other economies would be India, say, one and a half trillion, and the other economies are less than that. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, it's the big four economies now include China, and then the next group is what I would call the br BRIM economies, B-R-I-M, Brazil, Russia, India, and Mexico, which is uh, the fourth, adding Mexico to this. Now, the challenge is then for the world economy adjusting to globalization, and every country has to do this in its own way, absorbing and spreading the IT revolution, fitting China into the world economy, and stabilizing currency areas. We can't avoid that. We talk now about the low dollar and the high oil prices in dollar terms and high gold prices. This is an important uh, factor here. Key factors that have been making growth as rapid as it has been over the recent years is the U.S. economy has been the motor for the um, last 20 years, except for two 
big recessions in 2001 and 1991, the U.S. economy has been going forward rapidly, uh, and it's a the very efficient economy. The second factor is what can be looked upon as a negative or a positive, but it's the U.S. deficits. Because while they, the U.S. deficits are uh, uh, maybe from Americans' standpoint, they're not so good, uh, from the global standpoint, they provide the surpluses for all those other countries. And that is the fuel that gives them the liquidity and has pushed up the, uh, the role for economic expansion. The uh, Last year at the uh, Singapore meetings of the International Monetary Fund, one of the big subjects of discussion was the fact that the International Monetary Fund is in financial straits. It wasn't, it's making losses. It doesn't have enough income because nobody was borrowing from it. Nobody needed to borrow. So the world was healthy and so uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, IMF was in trouble. Like uh, uh, when people are healthy, the hospitals go broke. So we shouldn't look upon that as too bad a thing. But we have to worry about the question whether the, the deficits of the United States uh, if they could last and not do too much harm and people didn't get jealous of the fact that it let the United States uh, spend an extra five or six percent of its GDP more than it's producing, then this could go on and would keep the, road, the growth going on forever. Um, IT revolution, I've already mentioned that, the rise of China, the advent of the euro, uh, is now added a great deal of, I think, stability to the system because uh, uh, and having an alternative to the dollar is better than no alternative to the dollar. And uh, political stability, yes, of course, there are wars in uh, certain types, but by and large, this whole period has been a period of uh, high political stability and, uh, and globalization. Now, looking at globalization, which is part of the subject matter of in my title. Globalization is integration at the global level. It's been going on since 1945. That is a kind of post-war, World War II, almost hegemony in part of the world of the United States, what was called sometimes the West, but in a world that did not include uh, the Soviet bloc and China. And then the globalization began uh, after China in 1978 or 1980 joined the world economy and uh, uh, and then uh, after the Cold War ended when the Soviet Union and the Comic-Con bloc joined the world economy. So uh, for uh, to a very large extent the whole world was together and globalization could continue. It's almost associated with the Pax Americana of the single superpower. Uh, we used to, historians use the term the Pax Britannica of the late 19th century, the period when um, Britain uh, wasn't, was a kind of superpower with the British Empire. Maybe not in the same sense the United States is a superpower, but it was certainly the most prestigious and most advanced power. And uh, people talked about gunboat diplomacy and things like that, and British battleships keeping a kind of Pax Britannica. Now, now we have a Pax Americana. I think if you uh, you might not like that term, you might uh, resent it in some ways. But if you imagine what would happen to the world if the United States were, by some magic, and, uh, certain types, but by and large, this whole period has been a period of uh, high political stability and, uh, and globalization. Now, looking at globalization, which is part of the subject matter of in my title, globalization is integration at the global level. It's been going on since 1945. That is a kind of post-war, World War II, almost hegemony in part of the world of the United States. The, what was called sometimes the West, but in a world that did not include uh, the Soviet bloc and China. And then the globalization began uh, after China in 1978 or 1980 joined the world economy. And, uh, uh, and then uh, after the Cold War ended, when the Soviet Union and the Comic-Con bloc 
joined the world economy. So, uh, for uh, to a very large extent, the whole world was together, and globalization could continue. It's almost associated with the Pax Americana of the single superpower. Uh, we used to, historians use the term the Pax Britannica of the late 19th century, the period when um, Britain uh, wasn't was a kind of superpower with the British Empire. Maybe not in the same sense the United States is a superpower, but it was certainly the most prestigious and most advanced power. And uh, people talked about gunboat diplomacy and things like that, and British battleships keeping a kind of Pax Britannica. And now, now we have a Pax Americana. I think if you, uh, you might not like that term, you might uh, resent it in some ways, but if you imagined what would happen, to the world if the United States were, by some magic, obliterated or shot off into space, uh, how many countries would want to invade other countries? Who would stop the world? This is a big problem because we don't have a system of, uh, of governance in the world that has enough military bite to, to be an alternative to the United States. The entire world is now involved in globalization except Cuba, North, uh, North Korea, Myanmar, Iran, and Venezuela. Maybe Iran and Venezuela shouldn't be counted in that. And maybe North Korea were on the brink of a new regime uh, with possibility for the first time. I was in Korea uh, last week, uh, the possibility of um, integration of the two Koreas. So it's very hopeful that we're going to get even more complete uh, globalization than we've had before. It means. Um, uh, Proceeds, globalization proceeds by openness, the natural state of the world. It has many dimensions, economics, politics, cultural, social, religious, and military integration. It always involves integration. Here is uh, the way I was putting the thoughts together about how these have played out in the, uh, uh, in the uh, past 150 odd years. Um, uh, we, we don't need to discuss them much. I'm just because they're, they're even rather tentative. But trying to think in each of these directions, how um, the different types of globalization in different time periods has been become important. If we um, uh, look at this last part, the last line, they, I put them all as high. Now maybe I shouldn't because you might say, well, religious. Uh, integration. Is that high? Well, at least uh, in terms of knowledge, it's very high. There was a time when, a uh, hundred years ago, I would put it low in the 1960s, people wouldn't know what um, in the North America or much, much about what Buddhism is or what uh, Taoism is or the other other ideas. Knowledge was not very spread, but now knowledge is so high that integration is automatic. It doesn't mean that people have uh, agree on each other. There's a fragmentation and there's hostility and there's fanaticism and so on, but there's still integration in the sense of knowledge of it. Um, each dimension globalization has to be achieved depending on the type of country and type of government, type of religion. Every country is different and every country reacts to this external fact of, of globalization in a different way. Um, and it's, uh, and then uh, even if you get a kind of equilibrium degree of globalization, as in trade, you have an equilibrium degree of tariffs. We have very low tariffs in the world today compared to 50 years ago. We were really close to a free trade era in a, to a large extent today. But even if we get to a certain level of uh, integration by, uh, by a high degree of free trade, um, then it can be shocked by new technology. New technology upsets the whole pattern, changes the implications. Look at the way in which the uh, IT revolution has, has affected uh, all our lives and so I wouldn't be sitting here today talking and uh, traveling around as much as I did. Couldn't do it without the uh, without the IT revolution, which is the computer I'm looking at now and the access to knowledge and so on. Look at these revolutions that have gone on in the past: gunpowder printing, 
Price, science and technology, steam power, electricity. Um, after every revolution, there's a new framework, and it changes the balance of power in the world because some countries benefit, others are impeded by different uh, changes in technology. The terms of trade change. We have nuclear power, today we have uh, uh, computer and IT powers. So how much every country has to determine how much they want. Extreme degree would be free movement of goods and factors, technology, information, and money amounting closely to economic union. And some countries go to that. Some countries move toward economic union. Europe has moved a high degree of economic union, and, and with the euro or even monetary union. But most countries stop short of this. And the one thing that they very much stop short of is particularly the movement of people across borders. We all, every country has immigration controls and, and uh, quotas that impede that degree of integration. So integration uh, takes place more by trade and then by uh, ch exchanges of ideas. Uh, but even that's limited a little bit because countries, sometimes ideas may be bad ideas. Maybe people don't like um, the uh, some Hollywood blockbusters, the types of things, or or, or jazz, that, that so the restrictions put on put on things because they might be harmful in one way, either politically or morally or in some other way. Cultural diversity is something that people want and we have to accept because uh, we have different religious systems, different moral values, and uh, so all countries can't do the same thing. The same rules don't work for all countries. Uh, different geography positions. The uh, landlocked countries are in a different position with respect to globalization. Some countries uh, don't globalize because they're too far away economically from the world to globalize. You look at some countries inside the center of Africa. You look at a country like Mongolia, maybe, maybe maybe uh, Nepal, maybe some, these are, uh, integration, it means something quite different. And of course, airplanes reduce the, the danger and the limitations of landlocked countries. Um, now, bringing coals to Newcastle, talk about the, <coughs> something about the, the economic model and the sufficiency economy. <coughs> Uh, a stereotype of the economic model is based on individual self-interest, individuals maximizing utility within the framework of the market economy. Selfishness, economic selfishness carried to uh, is a, a, an extreme. Rational men make choices which make them better off. They, uh, that's what it means. This was the model used in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Adam Smith didn't think this was exactly what that man was selfish. What he, what Adam Smith wanted to do was to examine the, the role of selfishness in economic models and show what he was able to show was that uh, there's at least a silver lining to selfishness because the basic idea that man moving around pursuing his own selfish interests would in the long run benefit the public interest. It's the idea of maximization of society as a whole. Now, Smith himself wrote 15 years before the theory of moral settlements. His, that book was entirely about altruism and what, uh, what uh, uh, sympathy meant, the whole the doctrine of extended sympathy, of how people, um, we would call empathy probably, uh, how they look upon the others. So he was, uh, there are two models, it's a different model of how they, they look. Um, man is, a, the economic man is a selfish maximizer, but Smith, as I say, published that Theory of Moral Sentiments, a great book, and uh, it's examining altruistic sentiments. And the complete man, the actual man, is a mixture of those two things. The man is relation choices within the family, within the, the kinship group um, and neighboring group is different from man outside the family in the marketplace uh, operating for selfish, uh, selfish interests. <coughs> uh, the Majesty's philosophy advocates growth 
this is what uh, I've seen uh, from this advocates growth with economic stability. So growth, but growth with economic stability. Sustainable development, but sustainable development sound economic po macro policies and the equitable sharing of the benefits of economic prosperity. That's what we could read from the, uh, the discussions of, uh, of this. It eschews uh, excessive risk-taking, untenable inequalities, and the wasteful use of natural resources. Now this is not per se inconsistent with a good economic model, but it adds to it some motives that complement the economic man. These are empathy, uh, compassion, fairness, and generosity. It treats the human being as evolving rather than static through learning, ethics, perseverance, and tolerance. The triad is, uh, uh, involves moderation, wisdom, insight middle way between want and extravagance. Reasonableness, knowledge, integrity, and honesty, <clears throat> which includes understanding of the consequences of actions, not only in the present but in the future, not only on ourselves but on our uh, fellow humans and societies. And the third it involves resilience to risks, self-immunity to withstand shocks and reserves against uh, uh, shortage. So, Policies. The sufficiency individual, if we can think of that phrase. Sufficiency man, I'm using man to mean all humanity, is the economic man with empathy, compassion, fairness, and generosity built in. This model of the economic actor is not incompatible with economic development and globalization, nor is it incompatible with free enterprise and economic growth sufficiently macroeconomics, national policies should take account of the sufficiency triad. Countries should maintain enough reserves against shocks. Countries should take account uh, the, of, the, uh, of the effect of their policies on their neighbors and the rest of the world. Actions are to some extent reciprocated and overly aggressive actions invite retaliation, so it's also good actions, good behavior is often in self-interest behavior. Global interdependence is increased by the innovations in transportation and communication. And greater than ever before, global interdependence. Is, we see this everywhere. When every international discussion we see in, we can avoid global independence. Overuse of energy bids up the terms of trade against other countries. Changes in tariffs and quotas affect other countries' terms of trade and employment. Sharing of fishing, wildlife resources, preservation of endangered species, rainforests, problem of global warming, all elements of interdependence. The international business cycle is transmitted from one country to another. People are asking about, uh, we've had this great year, but is the uh, next year going to be poor? Is the U.S. economy going to slow down? Is that going to reduce exports from Thailand? Is it going to create a, a, a beginning of a crisis? How serious is it? Are we going to weather this? The balance of payments of one country has its equal and opposite counterpart in the rest of the world. I mentioned earlier the $900 billion deficit means that the rest of the world has a $900 billion surplus and they get those assets and liquidity instruments that to provide for the, that, that fuel economic growth. No country has an exchange rate to itself and we spend a lot of time in international goods talking about